Welcome to our next and very exciting Law and Technology speaker. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have, and I'm going to embarrass Danielle here now, one of the leading Law and Technology scholars in the United States, joining us at Elon, discussing her truly groundbreaking work on how we deal with hate speech and hate activities on the internet and through the internet and through communications. Uh, Danielle, who teaches at Maryland Law, is the author of a book from, I guess, last year? No, two, last year. 2014. Yeah, 2014. Wow. Ago. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, wow. Hate crimes in cyberspace. Uh, on a personal note, uh, Danielle's work has been influential in what I do, uh, having read your earlier article, uh, Technological Due Process, which opened up lots of doors uh, of thinking in the internet law field, but even more broadly in informational policy. So. As everyone knows, the format for these meetings is not your typical lecture or talk, but rather informal discussion where Danielle will share her thoughts on the work she is doing and solicit comments and questions. So Danielle, thrilled to have you here at Elon. Thanks for joining us today. I usually talk to Dave through when on his radio show, That's right? right? First answer, first yeah. 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 Casey, right. whatever. That's right. And I'm going to resist asking that, lots like, of questions. That like wonderful voice, right? It's great to have him in person. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about. I'm going to today. We'll talk about online harassment and stalking, which is the subject of my book, and have some thoughts about room for improvement or work I think we need to do. So that's maybe the comment part of ways in which law needs to develop and grow to address uh, harassment and stalking and what we all might do now, that is, right? Um, and some work I've done with AG Kamala Harris over the last two years um, to educate law enforcement. Maybe that's something that you could even think of for your own state and your own AG's office. Um, so let me just define harassment and stalking for you, right? Because I think we throw the term around a lot without, I think we can be careless in how we define it. And if we're careless, we're gonna sweep in a whole lot of speech, which we should not, right? So cyber harassment and stalking is the targeting of a specific individual for a repeated and persistent course of conduct, which has like a meaning in criminal law. Um, that is intended to and that causes severe emotional distress and often the fear of physical harm. So intended to terrorize and frighten and cause the fear of physical harm and intended to cause emotional, severe emotional stress and has that same effect on victims, right? And really important is how it's perpetrated. So um, it's usually like a perfect storm of abuse. So individuals terrorize people by threatening them uh, by impersonating them and suggesting that they're interested in sex on online posts. They post defamatory lies about people and often manipulate search engines to ensure that the lies are prominent in searches of their name. They invade privacy, right, by stealing nude photos, hacking into someone's computer to find revealing photos, sometimes their social security number, and then sharing them and posting them online. Or if sh someone is receives nude photos in a confidential relationship, betrays that trust, posts it on revenge porn sites alongside you know, people's home addresses, their contact information, cell phone numbers, and, they're, and supposed in, you know, says they're supposedly interested in sex. And lastly, harassers may use technology to shut down people's online tools. So a DDoS, a distributed denial of service attack, that's launched to literally shove a website offline and, and usually it's, it's a combination of them, right? A concerted effort to terrorize, to defame, to invade privacy, and sometimes use technology to silence people. Um, and I guess I'll just give you one example, just so you have a sense of, of, of the sort of depth of the problem. I feel like if you don't tell one experience, then it's just all words. It doesn't really mean anything, right? But um, Holly Jacobs was, had just graduated from Boston College. And she was moved back home to FI, to Florida to get her PhD in industrial psychology. And while she was at Boston College, she had a, a relationship with someone. And when she moved back home, the relationship was long distance. And so they shared nude images and videos absolutely for their eyes only. I mean, it was a two-way street. 
Hallie wasn't the only one, right, sending and sharing nude photos. Um, when they break up, about a month later, she starts getting like calls on her cell and emails from strangers that say they saw her ad and that they're interested in sex. Um, and what she was 2009, and, and she wasn't in, like sort of in the habit of Googling herself. So what she found when she wasn't like the a Google alert eight year yet, <laughs> right? Um, what she found was horrifying. There were 15 pages of, so not just 15 sites, 15 pages were so 300 sites, porn sites, revenge porn sites, uh, adult finder, adult dating sites with her nude photos often appended to her home address, so where she was living in her apartment, her cell phone number, and sometimes the tagline was, was an impersonation, suggesting that she wanted sex, she had rape, you know, anonymous rape fantasies, and please come find me at my house. Other, other ones had the tagline, Holly, her former last name, hot for teacher. And in the post, so with the nude photos, was the suggestion she was sleeping with her students. Remember, she was in graduate school. She was in her second year, so she had students who she was involved with as a graduate student. No, right? Um, her dean's office, the dean of students' office, got a phone call from anonymous individuals who accused Holly of sleeping with her students. She worked part-time at a consulting firm, and she received an email that said, if you don't send me more nude photos, I'm going to send the nude photos I have of you to your part-time employer. And so she refused, right? She called me. What do I do? I said, you're not sending them, right? And the person lived up on the threat, sent them to her part-time employer. Um, when she went back to her dean of students' office to say, because she was called in, there were these phone calls coming in saying she was sleeping with students and she had to talk to the dean of students, right? The, the dean's advice was pretty simple, and it was you have to change your name. We can't have a graduate student teaching someone when their students can Google them and find, you know, 30 pages of porn sites, revenge porn sites, adult finder sites that have your name, right? And as Holly said to me, the idea that she has to give up her identity, right? who she is, it sort of declares, Jonathan Zittrum would say, like reputational bankruptcy, right, over her life, seems such an untenable and crazy idea, right? But because she had such an unusual last name, she felt like she had to do it. And so now she has a very common last name. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about all the great things she's been doing, sort of in, in starting an Annie harassment group, anti-revenge porn group, the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, God bless her. Uh, you know, so, but that's not the everyday story, right? Most people lose their jobs, they can't get jobs. They have to fundamentally change how they live their lives, where they live. They're emotionally devastated, right? Um, and it silences them. I mean, so often victims explain to me they'd go offline. Right, because the more LinkedIn profiles, Facebook, Twitter, the more of an online presence you have, the more it exacerbates and pro it's like provocation to your harassers, right? It's like, how dare, I mean, you see in the comments, how dare that bitch have an LinkedIn? We're not gonna let her, you know, improve her own reputation online, right? So I guess what, we're at a law school. So let's, let's talk just like open questions about um, and things to think about is what law can do and what, you know, state law has some limits. So maybe that's where I sort of pose questions about or things to think about um, for the laws on the books in your state, right? So in about half of the states, there are stalking and harassment laws that are pre and threat laws that are pretty well designed, right? They will cover postings on third-party sites. You don't have to directly communicate a threat or the harassment or stalking to the individual, right? So it's not just confined to what we call telephone harass harassment statute or electronic mail harassment statutes, truly, which we passed in the early 2000s, right? Um, so we have about half of legislatures who have really kind of caught up and, and often mimicking the federal cyber stalking law, which is really well designed. But we do have half of the states, and I have a feeling North Carolina maybe is one of them, where you have harassment laws on the books that are too narrow and possibly unconstitutional, right? Okay, so what's the problem with being too narrow, right? There are, there are many harassment and stalking laws that only cover, 
harassing communications that are sent directly to the victim. Right, that's of course a problem, right? The the rape threats and death threats that you get on your cell phone, right? The harassing, frightening, lie-filled defamation that victim receives, right? But what happens when harasser sends victim's employer her nude photos, right? What happens when that person also puts it on Twitter and along with all of her identifying information? So a case from New York, this, these were the facts. Um, the defendant is, is indicted for harassment and stalking. But rightly, the appellate division dismisses it. Why? Because the harassment and stalking law only covers harassing, harassment that's sent di com directly communicated to the victim. So of course, it's just too narrow right, to cover this kind of abuse. Um, there are also harassment laws that include language like intent to annoy, right? That what we're punishing is a repeated course of conduct targeted at someone that is intended to and that does annoy. Now, that is incredibly unconstitutional, right? That is, under the First Amendment, we can annoy the living daylights out of someone, right? We can offend them. We can actually engage in hate speech, right? Hateful, awful speech about groups, and it's protected speech, okay? So certainly annoying speech, we can't regulate it, right? So, so in a couple of cases, you know, we have these state laws on the books that include this language that need to be fixed, and sometimes as applied, they'll get challenged, and they, the court will say, look, the speech is made up of threats, defamation, privacy invasions of a private person. So as applied, it's, con it's constitutional to punish the speech. If it's prescribable speech, right? It's a true threat. It's defamation of a private person about private matters. It's potentially criminal solicitation. But we got to fix those laws, got to say. Yeah. yeah. I feel like our presidential election where like we would have no election, no? Like everyone's really annoying. So man, both parties. So right, we would be in deep trouble. Right? All of us, totally. Um so and, and another like interesting question for you guys, and I don't know if you know the state of the law in, in North Carolina about invasions of sexual privacy. So the posting of someone's nude photos without their consent may be a crime, depending on how the statute is written. We have, in 18 months ago, there were two states, New Jersey and Alaska, that criminalized as a misdemeanor invasions of sexual privacy. And with the help of Holly's advocacy and Mary, my colleague Marianne Franks at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, there are now 25 states that outlaw, well, that criminalize, the posting of someone's nude photo without their consent, um, knowing that these photos were shared in confidence and betraying an expectation of privacy. So I guess the question is, uh, I wonder what the state of North Carolina's law, I don't, I don't know if you, do you have one? Uh, we, yes, North Carolina has right? actually fairly extensive okay. uh, and recent okay. uh, statutory mm -hmm. language that I believe covers all of the okay. things you just mentioned and mm -hmm. then some. Uh, there's off the top of my head, there's eight or nine separate statutes okay. that would cover cyber harassment, cyber bullying, and cyber stalking. Right. Um, and so I bet those lawmakers worked with Marianne Franks and That's Holly Jacobs. I'm just, a, know, she's okay. worked with all 25 states that have so passed in the last 18 months, which is great. Um, yeah. Of course. In the examples you've given where they don't have sort of criminal statutes that mm -hmm. you would advocate, I guess, um, are, are there civil remedies? Like, did the mm -hmm. person bring intentional affliction of emotional right. distress type claims? And I know that's probably not a quick remedy. That's no, but it, if in theory there, it's a terrific idea, right? That is bringing like tort claims. Or, or, or no, Andrew, exactly. Andrews. Aaron Andrews, $55 million, right, verdict for not the non-consensual taping of her undressing in her hotel room, right? So I'm sort of encouraged by the fact that we understand that as a true invasion of privacy. I mean, I, I guess by my lights, I'm not shocked, it certainly was, but that the jury recognized that there are certain sort of sacred private spaces 
that we have an expectation that we can be nude in and nobody's watching, right? The interesting move with the hotel, the negligent infliction of emotional distress where you didn't have physical harm is a, I think we're seeing law become more elastic, less rigid when it comes to emotional you know, distress, which is encouraging also. So much of privacy harms involve emotional harms. Um, but so like have victims sued, right, in tort for intentional infliction of emotional distress, public disclosure of private fact, I think is the tort you're thinking about as well with the posting of nude photos. Now Holly has a, just to take the example we were using, has an ongoing lawsuit against her ex um, in civil, like a civil suit, the criminal suit, I always find this so distressing, Florida brought a misdemeanor claim against the act. Many of the posts could be traced to his IP address. So we had the ability to connect the defendant with a lot of these postings. Um, but what happened was there were other posts that were difficult to trace and you needed a warrant. Like you couldn't, it wasn't just obvious and no one was turning it over. And so what law enforcement said to Holly was, it's a misdemeanor. I can't get a warrant, which might have been true under Florida law, but isn't that just, isn't that ridiculous? Shouldn't we change that law? At least A.G. Harris in, in California to help change that law in California, right? So the criminal case was dropped with this ongoing suit, but, and what Holly has done in connection with pro bono counsel, uh, K&L Gates has a new initiative, law firm, uh, pro bono initiative called the Cyber Civil Rights Legal Project. Where as soon as they announced it and they said, we will help victims of revenge porn and harassment, they had 100 clients in one day and basically couldn't take any more cases. Do you know what I mean? It's like a law firm, they could only have so much pro bono help, right? We know it's so expensive to sue. So that's for like for the typical person who doesn't have the resources like Aaron Andrews or Holly to bring suit and you know support counsel and computer forensic expertise, it's, it's hard. Right to, to fund that. You're not going to get someone to take it on contingency. Why? There's no deep pocket. The defendants probably are fairly judgment proof and ISPs, content hosts, they're all immune from liability under Section 230 of the Federal Communications Decency Act. And even Andrew's case had, yeah. was unique because it had the deep pockets of the hotel. That's right. Yeah, she's not collecting much from that maniac, right? Yeah, I, I think he has no money, right? But the deep pocket is the hotel. And what is your take on Section 230? Just quickly, because like that's because that, that is a uh, that's a as you know, and for students and others in the room, that is kind of one of the fissures in the yeah. technology law community. Section yeah. 230, if you're not familiar, is a yeah, law that effectively shields speech platforms like Facebook or Google or any of the others, right, from liability for the kinds of behaviors that Daniel talks about, and there are some very deep divisions within the technology law scholar community as to whether 230 has gone too far right. or whether it should be in, in its pure form. What's your take on that? So, so the interesting thing is, remember, it's part of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which was basically a law that was trying to get pornography off the internet and prevent children from seeing pornography. And most of the law was rightly struck down as inconsistent with the First Amendment. But like the only thing remaining was what the section's called the good, good, the title is Good Samaritan Blocking and Filtering of Offensive Content. That's the title of Section 230, right? And then it goes on to explain, um, and I'm not gonna know the words exact, you have the words in your head? that no provider or user of an information service provider will be responsible as a speaker or a publisher of someone else's speech, okay? And information content providers. Right, right. So, so how it's been interpreted, it could have been, like back in the early days of its interpretation, it could have only applied to people who were engaging in Good Samaritan monitoring and that they're not gonna be punished or held responsible for over or under uh, addressing user-generated con user content. That, that was one possible way, and frankly was the two very conservative congressmen, who, Cox and Wyden, who, who proposed this language, certainly that's what they had in mind, right? But nonetheless, it's been interpreted to apply to not just hosts that are engaged in Good Samaritan monitoring or filtering of offensive content, but all user-generated user content um, that if the liability is premised on being a speaker, provider, or distributor, we're not gonna hold you responsible. So Facebook can proceed 
and grow and we can have Twitter and we can have Tinder, frankly, and we can have the full gamut Reddit of all these platforms because there's low to no risk unless they're ignoring federal copyright claims because there's some exceptions to 230. But they can proceed without fear of liability for based on the speech or publication of what their users are saying, right? And, and I guess I'm in the camp that supports 230. Um, I think that we ought to rethink some of it in a very small way. Um, it has been interpreted, interpreted so broadly, almost too broadly, as to run away from its original meaning or purpose. But I think that we have Section 230, we have all these great tools. And if we didn't have Section 230, we might very well not have all these amazing platforms, even a blog that like Frank and Dan Sullivan, a bunch of I, us in like 2008 started. Um, I feel like it, we wouldn't have done that. You know, would we, would we have started our own little law professor blog, right? Um, because we have crazy commenters and if I didn't take it down right away, right, what would happen? So, you know, in, in my book, I propose a very narrow um, amendment to Section 230, which I realize is never happening. Congress is never doing anything. I get that, right? But in case Congress is ready and is interested, I have the amendment at the ready, right? And it would only carve out basically the worst actors, sites whose raison d'etre, like her, their whole purpose is to aid and abet defamation crimes, right, and stalking and revenge porn. That is, sites are now in the business of encouraging and facilitating clearly criminal speech like revenge porn, right? Um, and they can do that. And they brag to the press. Revenge porn operators are like, unless they're extorting individuals, which some are now in jail because they not only encourage the posting of nude photos, but charge $500 for the takedown of each photo, that's called extortion. And A.G. Harris has put a number of people in prison. God bless her, right? But the run-of-the-mill revenge porn operator is completely free to do its thing, right? Um, and they do, proudly, and encourage people to, you know, post nude photos of their exes and get the bitch back. No, I'm, I'm just explaining what myex.com, if you go, what the front page says, right? So, you know, I, I don't think those actors should enjoy, they're, not, they're by no means good Samaritans. Yeah. That's right. It's true. Right? I mean, we would be talking about amending amendments to Section 230 within a week. Right. Actually, yeah. that's, and that's something we want to wish for. But, no, but that's often uh, true, right? Like the Bork, um, the Video Privacy Protection Act comes out of the, the hearings. You guys, some of you are too young, right? But Judge Bork, who sat on the D.C. Circuit, was nominated by Bush or Reagan. Which one? Help me. Reagan, um, to be on the Supreme Court. And during his hearings, a very entrepreneurial reporter from the Washington side paper, like the Washington paper, I think it was called, or Washingtonian, uh, went to Judge Bork's blockbuster. Yes, in the old school days, we had like places where you could rent videos. They were physical things. <laughs> and ask the person at the counter, like, what is George, Judge Bork's videos? What does he rent? And the person gave it to him. It's like he's renting pretty in pink. Truthfully, he had a daughter, so it was not shocking, right? And then other Victorian era um, movies. And so literally this piece comes out in the Washington paper that reveals the videos that he's watching. And like literally Congress in three weeks passes the Video Privacy Protection Act. I think why? Because they're like, holy shit, the porn that I am renting is liable to have be released. So, um, you know, I, so the insight of, you know, we need personal experiences to, I think you're totally right. Um, but what's interesting is that with terrorism um, and Section 230, like terroristic speech, speech by ISIS and other terrorist groups, Joe Lieberman, when he was in the Senate, U.S. Senate, he was very interested in getting rid of 230 because maybe ISIL wasn't around but before he retired. But... Um, uh, you know, there, there have been proposals to change Section 230 on the table before, and I think you're right, coming out of um, either personal experience or uh, worries of the day that are kind of orthogonal to what 
230 is about, right? Like terroristic speech, that's protected speech for goodness sakes for the most part, right? But he, that was his bugaboo for a while. So I know we have questions, don't we? Yeah. Gawker had recently been in, and I realized at some level they're a new site, but where does that line between YX Girlfriend and Gawker fall? I mean, at what level are they are, are these sites making the argument that this should this is public information, that we're just exposing the character of these individuals or Literally today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if for Gawker, yeah. Gawker's arguing that yeah. how far down the food chain is that argument right. going and how far down the food chain do you think it, it's it's a viable argument? And the risk of being a total prude plus Gawker. I mean, I have the sense, but it, it's just <laughs> looking at people. Let's yeah, start, start with the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. I told there's some like funny thing I just missed. Okay, so what were you saying? I say what it, describe what? what Gawker is for the so describe how Gawker has responded no, to no, the no, whole thing. No, no, it's from okay. the porn sites. Gawker was right. designed to be kind of an irreverent news site that right. was going to report anything about people and just put it out there, and it has become yeah, perhaps news, that. A news juggernaut, that. right? But I think you ask a really wonderful question, which is, um, in this era in which we can all be news people, right? When I blog at Forbes or I blog at Concurring Opinions, Am I a news person? Not really. But this platform has given us, is, these platforms have given us access in ways that the, the mass media was, you know, was so narrow, so tightly controlled, right? And so we could imagine subreddits even being engaged in cultural, obnoxious cultural social discourse, right? Or 4chan, right? There's some really nasty corners of the internet that still made, there's an argument that what they're doing would be interesting as a matter of public conversation, right? The, when it comes to nude photos, so I, so I want to distinguish, though, the myx.com from Gawker, and I still think Gawker should be liable. I want to they'd explain why. Um, so uh, somebody's gore, I just, somebody's whatever, someone's unhappy with me in the room, and that's okay. Um, I could take it. Uh, the big difference is, I think, sites like myx.com they make no pretense that they're a news-generating site. And it's, it's implausible, I think, for me to argue that when you solicit and encourage people to betray confidences, which in fact have no first member, you, if you breach someone's confidence, you're, you're aiding and abetting something that is, can be prohibited in the law, right? Um, that fact, and that you're saying, hurt them, embarrass them, shame them, that dumb bitch, right? And it's often women who are posted on these sites, though sometimes men too. Um, th I think there's just no argument that this is anything but an invasion of privacy, sexual privacy, um, depending, of course, on the facts and circumstances. If it's porn that's being reposted, that's porn, that's consensual, God bless, right? That's fine. But, you know, these revenge porn sites are by no means engaged in any sort of search of truths. You know, we, we, why do we think of the First Amendment? We think of the First Amendment, we value it, because it helps us figure out how to govern ourselves, right? And it, you know, helps us seek out truths, truths worth, worth talking about, including offensive truths, right? Uh, and it helps us express ourselves, right? The interesting thing about someone else's nude photos that they took and shared with you when the person posts it, they're not posting their own speech. They're coercing someone else's expression, right? Victim doesn't want it there. It's non-consensually posted. So the autonomy story about the first measures does not work with nude photos, right? Um, is it helping us figure out and sort out truths? Ridiculous, no, <laughs> right? It's a, a photo that's nude that's shared in privacy. Um, and private communications is something that fosters speech, right? Um, <laughs> And it's certainly not going to help us figure out how to govern ourselves, right? Like sorting out social and cultural discourse, right? The, the thing is, revenge porn operators never have to make that argument because they're immune from liability, because it's user-generated content. The problem with Gawker is that they, Gawker, it's not user-generated content for Gawker. They posted the sex videos themselves, right? And the reason why I think they should be liable, and maybe a small, I, I don't want them to go out of business, certainly, 
but they posted a video um, of Hulk Hogan. The video was surreptitiously taken. He played no part and never gave permission, right? It was two people having sex, right? We can talk about what happened. We can talk about what's, you know, that he had a videotape in, and, and have every right to do that under the First Amendment. Do we actually need to see him have sex, right, with someone? Is it newsworthy? Celebrities should be able to have sex. I don't care who you are, right? It's the most, as one court said in Central District of California, uh, in the a case involving Pamela Anderson Lee and, and her and Tommy Lee, they made a sex tape, it was stolen, it was posted on the internet, and a porn business, Vivid, was selling it. And the, the court says, we're enjoining you from selling it because that's the most sacred of sacred affairs, is sex, right? Um, and just because he played on TV, someone with big bravado, and talked about his sex life does not mean that we need to actually watch the video, right? which is when you're so vulnerable, I, I just, I think it's a crazy argument that it's a matter of public discourse. And courts have agreed with me, but we have other courts that don't. What about things like uh, the Santorum, when you, when you type in Santorum? Right, the, well that's political speech, right? It's, so what does it say like, what's the wording? It's not nice, but. No, it's very nice, it's just, it's a, I, and I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's. It's, a, it's something about sex. Yeah, it, it, so it, and so. Yeah, it's, it's, like a, it's like a discharge due to uh, all disease or something like that. I don't remember. It's, right. And then, you know, that's right. the whole setup just to, uh, but, but that, that was, I mean, he's it's offensive, bigger, but it, right. and it was also designed in right. order to target him right. and to right. harass and embarrass him because right. he had said some rather <laughs> right. hateful things about the, uh, the population. Gay community, was, right. But uh, what about, like, but that's different, right? We're not talking about a privacy invasion, about right. the non-consensual taping of an of of right. uh, an event taken in a in a home in a bedroom, right? That is has important norms about privacy in those spaces, right? Just like Erin Andrews in her hotel room, that are sacred and we cherish, and we do. There is an exceptionalism here that is right, right? That's political speech by my lights. It's it's you know, the Wild West is political speech, but it's still political speech, the Santorum searches. Now, the, the, the harassment issues, I mean, we're talking, um, well, at one level does an aggressive Yelp review, uh, you know, or even a concerted effort at an aggressive Yelp review against mm -hmm. a provider that somebody's not happy with mm -hmm. become harassment. Right. Because, um, I, I, you know, I, I had a chance to, to briefly Thumb through your book. I didn't get to read it mm -hmm. in depth, but you know there there tends to be a lot of a lot of focus on the demeaning character because of sexual activity. Mm -hmm. um, is that a requirement? Do they have to talk no. about sex? I mean, so, you know, maybe we can talk so bit. long as it's unprotected speech, right? So if that Yelp review involves defamation, right? If it involves threats, true, credible threats. Right. I don't know what's on the review. We can make it up, but right. If it involves a privacy invasion like the stealing of a nude photo and posting it alongside the Yelp review, right? So harassment has it has to have core components that is made up of speech we can prescribe. So saying to me, Danielle, like revenge porn operators really don't like me. So on my Twitter feed, I get I used to get all these revenge porn operators who were then still in business saying like, Citroen, you're the 2016 of the year. Just put in a lovely word. It's all me. And you know, they was like filled with you're a liar, you're this, you're that, you know, social justice warrior should be killed, you know, not lovely stuff. Um, was that harassment? Well, it was targeted, it was continuous, but it wasn't a true threat. It wasn't a privacy invasion. It was sort of this like opinion that I'm like a yucky, you know, I'll, I'll forget, skip the curse word. Um, it wasn't harassment in the way that I would understand it. I, it's Twitter, I could, I could turn it off. It's not my home where I can't escape. So it wasn't fun, right? I blocked them, God bless Twitter for coming a long way. These companies are great and the tools like they give us. Yeah. Well, yeah. My whole thing with the yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Are there any other tools that they use to try to figure out? 
possible for that? No, no, that's such a good question because law enforcement, you know, they, especially at the state and local level, they just don't get the law and they have a really tough time with the technology. So local law enforcement's great at street crime and robberies and, you know, mail fraud. You know, there are things that they're good at. But this stuff, they're like, oh, goodness. So, you know, increasingly, though, we're having the FBI train um, state and local law enforcement about, hey, you got to get a warrant. You got to go to the OSP, the online service provider, to get an IP address. Then you go to the ISP. Um, I think we're getting increasingly more sophisticated on, like, we're cookies that we can, like uh, our friend Ed Felton and, and uh, other friends in, from Princeton have written some interesting stuff about how, like, increasingly we're less hidden, <laughs> right? If someone's using Tor, I mean, there may be a way that people can hide themselves, but based on their other online activity, we may be able to piece it together, but we definitely need some sophisticated people with some sophistication in the technology to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's often not true if they don't have it at the local and state level, but I think like AG Harris in California is working really hard yeah, to get like training. The They're awesome, yeah. No, totally. A.G. Harris has, um, about a year and a half ago, she started the, a task force on cyber exploitation. And I was part of it, and companies were part of it, and we sat down and we talked about the problem of harassment and the exploitation of new photos and stalking and threats. And all the tech companies were there, and, and literally two months later, this was last summer, you know, Google and Bing announced that they're going to de-index nude photos so long as the person said it's not, you know, I never consented. Um, yeah. Twitter changed its policies about revenge porn, about non-consensual pornography, about widening its definition of threats. Facebook has always banned nudity, but now they're clear about good nudity and bad nudity. You like, you know, nudity that's for a political purpose, like showing mastectomies, mm -hmm. right, versus the non-consensual posting of someone's nude photos. So you know, we've made some progress, you know, but I, whether law enforcement is totally there, baby steps, I think is really like my best answer to that one. Yeah. In your view, to what extent could Gawker or Store uh, verbally describe the details of the of video like the Hogan video? I think they absolutely can. I mean, remember, Gawker did that. They actually did both. So I read the dialogue about it, and then I, because I was getting interviewed about it all the time when it was first happening. So, and of course, I had to watch some of the video because if my friends are going to, journalists are going to ask me, I have to have some opinion about this. Um, and I think a verbal description of what someone saw, there's something wildly different about that description and actually seeing it. And I'm sure that Hulk Hogan would say the same thing, that it's the seeing the video. He has. Didn't he say that on the stand? It was like, it's like life changing. Right. And, and I, you know, I think we can all kind of share and understand that. Right. But so I would support or argue, I would defend Gawker's ability to write about it. But I just would draw that line and say you need another lawyer to argue about the video. You know? So they can write about it with no restrictions? With no restrictions. No. You know? A case called um, Bartnicki versus Vopper, Supreme Court, um, takes up the question of a, a, a cell phone call between a, a union leader and I think a rep. Um, was surreptitiously taped, cell phone conversation. And in that cell phone conversation, the union leader basically implied that he's going to blow up the house of the opposing union, like of this union movement. The tape is released to a radio show host who plays the tape on the radio. And the, um, the person making the threat uh, sues for a violation of wi the wiretap law, right? Case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court explains that usually when we think of the release and disclosure of private conversations, that the protections under the Wiretap Act are valid, typically speaking, because what they do is foster private speech. But if we didn't have privacy in our communications, we probably wouldn't talk freely on the cell phone or on the telephone, right? And so on the one hand, the court says we're balancing actually speech on both sides of the coin, right? On the one hand, there's a speech interest in having a law like the Wiretap Act preventing the disclosure of stolen, you know, the, the radio host didn't steal it, but of non-consensually taped communications because it fosters private speech. And the court said on the other hand, though, the disclosure of that tape 
is free speech, right? It, that is incredibly important. So the court looked at the actual content of the tape and said because the content of the tape was related to a matter of public interest, it was about a union fight and potential violence, um, the emphasis of the court's analysis was on because normally we might uphold, like in dicta, the court explains, we might uphold a, a lawsuit when you sue a radio show host for playing a tape of a you know of private conversation, which you don't, didn't have consent to show it, if it was purely about purely private matters, right? The the difference, as the court explained, was that the content of the speech was about something that mattered for public conversation, right? A union fight, potential threats, right? Um, and so Barton Gee versus Bopper, I think, help us understand that when it comes to speech about purely private matters, there's certainly an argument that the wiretap and other privacy laws, like the tort, public disclosure of private fact, isn't dead, right? So long as what being what is so disclosed is something that we would say is a purely private matter. And so courts have upheld cases of for suing for public disclosure of private fact for nude photos, like revenge porn cases, and also for social security numbers. We have a couple more questions or comments that I will ask one. I'm, I'm full of them. Um, and no, speaking, never. Uh, Shocking. Let me, so what okay. about, I mean, we're throwing all of these scenarios at you. Danielle. No, I like. This, this is one that's kind of local. Okay. Um, oh, I like local. Well, oh, I think I have something also to talk to you about local, which is so crazy. Okay. No, you tr maybe it's the same thing. Okay, it could be. Um, Greensboro is the home of an entity called Medical Justice. Oh, no, not the okay, same thing. So this is kind of like this, this entity uh -huh. is, um, equivalent mm -hmm. to Reputation Defender. Okay. Um, it's an entity that and it's changed its business model. But to make a long story short, mm -hmm. Medical justice uh, existed uh, to allow doctors mm -hmm. to, through contractual and other rights, lock down right. their patients yeah. from posting information yeah. that the doctors deem to be right. the non disclosure agreement. Obviously, the speech aspect of it, right, and inaccurate or worse, right, right um, in order to protect their reputations. And of course, the reputational hit, obviously, is the inability if the information is false, but even if it's true, to rebut it in meaningful ways. Right. Um, but it is right a way to deal with speech. It may not be, although it could be hate speech, mm -hmm. but a speech simply that- That's probably defamatory. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, I'm curious. I mean, from a, from, a, uh, from a speech regulatory standpoint, given the harms that you focus on, should we be concerned about an entity like Medical Justice or Reputation Defender, which gets right. more publicity? I mean, or is, that, or is that a different is that a different issue? In your mind? So my so my just follow up question is um, Medical Justice. My my understanding was that doctors were asking patients to sign non disclosure agreements, right? Confidentiality agreements, right? Yes. And I guess I'm of two views, right? Doctrinally, we know that um, you can contract around the First Amendment. Period. The end. Cohen versus Cal's, right? So, if it's a fairly bargained for agreement, confidentiality agreement, it should be upheld, right? I think some of the difficulty is it's kind of coercive, you know, <laughs> right? And this is a person who is basically your steward, your fiduciary. Your doctor is your fiduciary. Like he owes you a duty of loyalty and care and all of that. Um, the people just. I have a harassment case that I talk about a bit in the book, but I didn't go like all the way into it. But a dentist was um, harassed on Yelp and um, by a patient who had signed one of these agreements. And so she asked him to take it down. I mean, he was really harassing her. He said she had AIDS, that she slept with students, uh, uh, patients, that she was giving people AIDS, that she had herpes. You know, like it was truly like it was not she's a bad doctor which hello you're a bad doctor we can talk about this unless you sign a confidentiality agreement um and so she asked patient to take it down she said look you signed this agreement and it got worse of course because the patient then wrote on yelp and this bitch is trying to shut me up and then it was literally the yelp disaster of thousands and thousands and thousands of posts and calls to her office um um, saying that you have AIDS, 
you know, like really bad harassment that followed on the grounds that the posters were angry at her because she tried to silence him to enforce this non-disclosure agreement. She had to shut her practice. So her malpractice rates went up, her patient ratings on every single website went from five stars to zero stars. It was a disaster, right? But so I think your question raises two things, right? One is the, um, how do we feel about agreements to silent speech when it's contractual, right? And what does that do for our system of free expression, right? And its intersection with my world is, is smaller, right? Um, and it's it, it ostensibly is to ward off harassing speech, but it also wards off those agreements, truthful speech, that would be really important for a patient to know, right, if someone wasn't clean in their care, right? Um, and so I, I guess I, I think I would say that I think we should uphold confidentiality agreements. I think those are important. I feel like my whole revenge porn story is about confidentiality. But maybe as a matter of contractual law, there may be questions about unconscionability and overweening. Is it like a to take or to leave? It's, yeah, I know nothing about contracts. You would be able to walk me through the whole thing. But um, they do trouble me. I'm not saying they don't trouble me from a free speech perspective. I think I would defend them if I had to, um, if they were negotiated. Does that make sense? No, it does. We have, we have one more minute, so do you want to share your... Oh, yeah, my crazy... Okay, so in North Carolina, I don't know where, there were teens, 15 and 16, who shared nude photos with each other. They're in a relationship. No one else saw the photos but themselves. And um, Coach, think of the boy, gets a hold of his cell phone, punished for something else. And he looks at the phone, sees the nude photos of boyfriend, girlfriend having shared with each other, goes to the police. Police arrest young children, 15 and 16, even though they didn't share with anyone else, no one else with their eyes only, arrested them for child pornography laws, which technically speaking is true, <laughs> right? Uh, and they both pled to misdemeanors of a different sort. I don't think any of, either of them are on the sex offender registry, but like talk about where we should really worry about laws overreaching. And I sort of, I try to recognize that in my book, that is, you know, law has its place. It's a blunt instrument. It can't do it all. And sometimes we should be careful what, for what we wish for because we have those kinds of abuses of discretion. We are we are out of time. I want to uh, first say thank you to Danielle, Professor Citron, for joining us. Here. Um, Danielle is speaking on the main campus at 7:30 in Whitley Auditorium. A, I think not a substitute, right? Today, right. Uh, but a talk. Um, and we are, we are, I'm glad Lee just came in. We are indebted to Lee Bush and the main campus for having Danielle here. So thank you for that. Um, also, and I, would, I, I will embarrass Danielle and her colleagues, yeah. the, uh, very quickly by saying Maryland law over the last few years.